but also you need to factor in the surgical team right the surgical team in the operating room how they interact with the surgeon and also the the parts we talked about surgeon fatigue you know physical and and cognitive fatigue clock in scrub up and join us behind the red line you're listening to first case a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now it's time to roll back and start the first case. This week on First Case, we speak with Anthony Fernando, CEO at Ascensus, and Melanie. We're going to be talking about what is going to sound like the future, like the Matrix. And as you'll hear, this may not be in the very distant future. It could be right around the corner. Everybody is familiar with digital surgery in the form of robotics. But what does robotics allow us to do in the future with the right technology and infrastructure in place? You're going to find out today on this episode. You know, I don't know how I feel about surgery moving in that direction. It's exciting. And I can see a lot of potential for when it would really be needed. But the nurse and the OR in the room in me really gets nervous when I think about where's the clinician? Where's the surgeon? How far away are they? Lots of things to think about when you think about the future of surgery and where it could be heading. And it's going to be really interesting to hear him talk about it today. Well, maybe we'll all get a little more comfortable with technology after we talk with Anthony. We're going to be right back after a short break. Hi, I'm Paul Wafer. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm Jeremy Gibson Roar. And I'm Justin Poulin. A 17 Studios production. You're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Anthony Fernando, CEO at Ascensus. And Anthony, I'm really excited to have you on the show today. We're going to be talking about the future of digital surgery. And while I think the audience may know what that means to them in one way, we're going to be diving into that and really painting a picture for the future. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Justin. Glad to be here. And uh, it's something I'm very passionate about and looking forward to speaking to you. So let's just provide an overview of digital surgery, because I think for a lot of people, when they hear digital surgery, they're going to anchor right on robotic surgery. But I know as you and I prepared for this interview and talked through some of the points that it really means a lot more than that. And also there's some pretty interesting implications for it as well. Can you kind of set the table here and tell us exactly what we're going to be talking about today in terms of digital surgery? Sure, happy to do that. So when you think about surgery, minimally invasive surgery specifically, the surgeon typically holds an instrument and through a trocar, the instrument goes in the abdomen and you perform surgery. So the surgeon's hands are directly connected to the instrument and the instruments inside the abdomen of the patient that performs the surgery. So now you take that a notch above and talk about robotic surgery Instead of the surgeon holding the instrument, now there's a robotic manipulator holding the instrument, but there's a surgeon still on the other side of this robotic manipulator. Uh, That's typically robotic surgery. Now you add another layer to that, which is the digital layer, where you have a camera that's looking inside the abdomen of the patient, the endoscopic camera, and the the video can start providing data to the surgeon looking at this camera. They can identify anatomy. The surgeon can identify and measure certain sizes, 
inside the abdomen. So now it's a whole new layer of digital information that the surgeon can can see. And the primary difference, Justin, is you know if you think about robotic surgery, still it's the surgeon is the only person who can still see the patient's anatomy and make a decision. But when you talk about digital, there is one other person who can actually see, which is the computer. In addition to the surgeon, the computer can see what the same thing that the surgeon is seeing and the computer does image processing and image analytics and goes into another layer of visualization in addition to the surgeon. So as a result, you get a much higher fidelity level of information that can the surgeons can leverage in order to perform surgery. So that that's really what, what we talk about digital surgery. It's, it's really a level above robotics. And additionally to robotics, you mentioned this concept to me of telesurgery. And so I think a lot of times when I think of telemedicine, I'm thinking about, you know, some sort of remote connection with a physician. And usually it's a lot more about, you know, generally seeing your PCP or maybe you have a flu, flu like symptoms or something like that. Or maybe you have asthma and it's flaring up. And so you're just having a consult, you know, via electronic media for telemedicine. But what is telesurgery? So telesurgery, I think it's a similar connotation to, to what you just talked about, but this is performing surgery, right? You, you might have a really good, highly experienced surgeon in one city, but there's a very critical patient in, in another geography. And how do you leverage this expert surgeon skill in, in a distant place? So now you can have a, a robotic manipulator with instruments in a remote place and this experienced surgeon can sit at a console and perform the surgery. So that's that's the fundamental premise of telesurgery. However, I mean, it, you can think about it from a distance or you can think about it from a productivity point of view. You know, even in within the walls of a hospital, you can have two or three patients in two or three different operating rooms and one surgeon sitting in on one console connecting to these different rooms and performing the cases instead of having to go through. So I think it will probably start within the hospital walls kind of set up and then it can expand to a greater distances as bandwidth and communication bandwidth becomes more available and more reliable and latency drops, etc. But that's the basic premise is a distance greater distances between the surgeon and the patient. So, Anthony, I understand the concept. What my understanding is up to now, there's been challenges with the speed of the visualization delays in the manipulation of a robot versus the patient. Is that still an issue? And is that going to be cleared up by 5G technology? Yeah, Paul. So I think, you know, 5G technology has the potential to do that, true 5G, because the 5G that we hear about is not true 5G. The true 5G is very limited. If you think about the U.S., there's probably maybe three, four metro areas that have true 5G. Everything else is just purely mobile communication purposes. But if you get into an area where you can access true 5G, then the bandwidth is higher and the latency is significantly lower. And, and you could accomplish a good result with telesurgery, including pushing the surgical image in order to reduce latency. But as, as 5G technology matures, I think it, this is going to become more real and we'll be able to uh, leverage this for uh, telesurgery. So when you say the 5G, and Paul asked that question, one of the things that comes to mind is how you were talking about the surgeon being in the same hospital, but not in the same room. I'm assuming that it's really the technology to span distances that's presenting the challenge and that true 5G could solve. And right now, 
do hospitals already have the speed and the technology to be able to, you know, perform that robotic surgery from another location in the hospital? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're within the, if you're within a local area network within a hospital, then sure, then, then I think you don't have the latency issues and you can very comfortably perform that surgery. But when you go outside of a local area network and, and try to go broader, that's when latency becomes an, an issue. So it, it's a distance challenge. So you mentioned or teed up some of the benefits of the fact that the surgeon wouldn't have to leave one room and go into another room and then into another room, that they could perform these surgeries from one central location. And I'm assuming almost one after another. So I know in the back of my mind, I'm thinking one implication is productivity. But what are some other implications for a design like that? Even if it's all in the same building, what are some some positive implications for this you know, in moving forward into this more digital surgery world? So I think some of our, some pretty you know, pragmatic benefits, right? The surgeon won't have to be scrubbing in and scrubbing out or going from room to room. The second, few people in the OR, you have less disruptions, even less infections. I mean, you name it, you have few people in the OR. I think it'll lead to better outcomes uh, overall. So there are, you know, benefits of the sort that will help. And I think also the OR turnover uh, turnover times uh, could potentially improve uh, as a result of this. So what about like ergonomics? And, you know, some of this conversation is really about what's the future, right? Like once the technology can support that remote part where you're not all in one building. You know, I definitely want to talk about machine learning and augmented intelligence. And, you know, I know you said that the computer is also seeing the patient. So I'm assuming that there's some diagnostic things that may be coming down the pike in that regard. But you talked about infection control, less people in and out of the room. But what about the ergonomics aspect of things too? Yeah, so... That's a great, a really good question, Justin, because when you think about complications and variability, one of the contributors to complications and surgical variability is, you know, fatigue. Fatigue can come in, in terms of physical fatigue or cognitive fatigue right now. So talking about ergonomics specifically with respect to physical fatigue, Traditional surgery, whether it's laparoscopy or open, the surgeon is standing up over the patient, you know, in awkward positions with the surgical team for long periods of time, you know, case after case throughout the day. So being able to be seated in a comfortable position and and performing these surgeries throughout the day is definitely going to be less taxing on the surgeon's physical fatigue aspects. So ergonomics is going to be a big contributor. And also, right, if if you look at the surgeon community, there's a pretty good number of surgeons who've had back and shoulder complications over time. So this this will address that because of the comfortable ergonomic, you know, position where a surgeon can sit down and and perform the surgery. And and I think it, it has the potential to extend the careers of surgeons. So, so Anthony, in a situation like this where it might be multiple rooms, how would the room be staffed with the surgeon either being in another room or, you know, in the corner of the room, what level of skill do the other personnel in the room have to have? Is there an assistant surgeon or a PA or nurse practitioner that's putting the trocars into the patient and helping during the case, changing out instruments. How does that work? Yeah, Paul, so I mean, this is all conceptual right now, right? So currently, you know, most most of the time, including what we do, the surgeon is sitting inside the OR, but in one corner of the room and the patient is in the middle of the room. And we see variation. It depends on the hospital. It depends on the country that you do surgery. Some surgeons will not allow any assistant to 
put in a troca or even put in a clip, for example, when the surgeon, you know, wants to do that. Then there are other surgeons and hospitals that have empowered assists or, you know, surgical assistants or whichever uh, position or role they play have been trained to perform certain functions. So it, it depends. There's no fixed format. It all depends on how each institution establishes their protocol and, and doing so. But I, I think, you know, if you really think about it, you can, you know, segregate certain duties and, and get the surgeon to focus on the critical tasks and, and be able to get others trained to do some of the routine tasks in order to get, you know, improve outcomes overall. So it, it, it depends by institution, by, by country. And, and this, uh, at least now, even in normal surgery, we don't see a difference, right? So it's something that will have to be thought of and, and, and created as things uh, progress. I see. So here's another question about the, the digitalization of surgery and the learning of the machine. Now, when the surgeon is operating, you said the computer is looking at the surgery as well. Is there any type of heads-up display or measuring devices that the surgeon can utilize to measuring what they're looking at or anything in that regard? Yeah, Paul. So that's a great question again. So I think so. The cap, what the surgeon's looking at on the screen is the endoscopic view, right? So whatever the camera is seeing. Then what we do is we use the two uh, instruments, for example, uh, we use the two instruments as pointing devices. And now the two instruments, you can measure between the two instruments. So you can place, you can go into like a measurement mode, you move one instrument to one corner of a certain anatomy and you move the other, co- other instrument to another edge of the anatomy. And now you can get a measurement between those two points above what you're actually seeing. And then you, you can get a straight line measurement, you can get a contour measurement, you know, so you, without introducing any new tools to the surgical site, but with the tools that you're currently using, that the tools become, you can, for, for, for simplicity's sake, I'll just say as pointers. They'll be point, less kind of pointers where that you use as endpoints to measure. So those are going to be like overlaid above the anatomical the endoscopic image that that the surgeon would see. So it's almost like building the future of digital surgery is like building a multi-tool. So everybody's always thinking about, you know, kind of like the Leatherman, right? It has, it does all these different things in one tool. And to your point, not having to introduce another instrument into the case, like that even has some implications for infection control if they're able to do multiple things. But how does this lead us into machine learning and augmented intelligence as far as, you know, kind of the wave of the future of where digital surgery can take us? Sure. So I think, you know, when you think about machine learning and even augmented intelligence, it's about data, right? So once we we are going to be, once we continue to collect data and look at what the norms are, what the patterns are, now you can start learning from that data and be able to say, okay, we see this surgeon being able to perform a gallbladder removal, you know, in X minutes. And we think that's good, good performance, good outcome. So now how do we get that good performance to be leveraged across other surgeons in other communities who might not be as proficient or as fast as performing that. So now we've uh, once the, the once the routine is learned, now there's some kind of a digital twin or a digital assistant that can guide the surgeon through this process, saying this is what best practice looks like, and th- that that process can be followed. So it, it's really uh, ultimately for us and and where we are headed is really trying to learn the best from everywhere and enable that best practice to be used anywhere to level the the field of surgical skill and and what's good in order to reduce the the variability 
that exists. So it, that, that's really where machine vision and machine learning comes in. But thinking about the augmented intelligence part, you know, think about accidents happening during surgery. You know, by accident, you nick a certain vessel or something like that. But why does that happen, right? Why that happens is either you didn't realize that something was happening or you couldn't see what was happening. But now think about where you can set a no-fly zone, saying that this is the zone you're going to do surgery and you say everything outside this circle is a no-fly zone. So if once you set it, now the instruments can never leave the circle. So the chances of you making some kind of error significantly reduces because your instruments are not going to accidentally go anywhere. So that's really where the augmented intelligence piece comes in is being able to set these interactive parameters based on the anatomical image that is being fed live and and you, you leverage that to provide certain boundaries and guidance. Okay, that's fascinating because I've been in cases where we've nicked a vessel and we've gone from suddenly we're robotic to open and we're fixing things and it's scary and it can be very hectic. My thought goes to thinking of all the technology and all of the data that's being collected and all of the learning on the machines. But I think about HIPAA and patient privacy. And is there any special consideration for patient information with all of the data that's being collected in digital surgery? Sure, Melanie. I think that's a very extremely important question. And I think I don't think we've kind of cracked the code on exactly how to address that, right? But the thing is, currently, the data and the focus is all intra-abdominal. So there's no identifying information that can be traced back to a patient. So as I mean, currently, there are many, many imaging technologies where as soon as you remove the endoscope from the abdomen, it stops recording. So there's, there's things like that. But the, the data that we are primarily focused on is all intra-abdominal. So there was, that therefore, it, we don't run into this issue yet, but it's a matter of time before we're going to need to provide certain securities for protecting privacy and information. So, Anthony, I can see, and I think Paul was somewhat alluding to this, like who's in the room, you know, what are their roles, what are their functions, but as we talk about the development of digital technology and just how that's going to happen over time, you know, I think you said to me, historically, it's been patient driven, but, but you're thinking that it also needs to incorporate the clinicians. And I think that really touches on something that Paul was getting at is, you know, when we develop this, how do we develop it, you know, with a new perspective and not just you know, the improvements for the patient outcomes, but also the implications for clinicians. And and I think you were kind of talking about it too, but I was hoping you could kind of drill in a little bit closer on that. Sure, sure, Justin. So I think when you think about, you know, traditionally, it's always been patient outcome. And and now you ask what drives out a good patient outcome. Obviously, the surgeon and the surgical skills, a key element of it. Uh, but also, you need to factor in the surgical team, right? The surgical team in the operating room, how they interact with the surgeon, and also the the parts we talked about, surgeon fatigue, you know, physical and, and cognitive uh, fatigue. So now if the if 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 digital technologies can reduce the cognitive load of the surgeon and then robotics uh, manipulation can reduce the physical fatigue of the surgeon and also create a more collaborative environment between the surgeon and the surgical staff in the operating room where the surgical staff is also aware of what's going on. They see what the surgeon is seeing with all the uh, digital overlays and and all the different markers and, and things like that. Now, I think that will lead to a better outcome because the surgeon is, can focus on the the critical aspect of what they do and not have to worry about, you know, am I going to, you know, hit something or make some mistake because you have all your guardrails up in terms of no-fly zones, you get measurements, you, you want to get a 
uh, measurement, you can see things and, and even, you know, there are things where we are working on where we'll be, we can identify certain anatomy. We can identify the bile duct and say, okay, this is the, this is the bile duct. Even though it's not visible to the outside, we, we, you know, can predict saying in the general area, this is kind of where it is. So all of these are only going to help improve patient outcome, but the focus is really on improving the, the surgeon and the surgical team's performance and, and then that leading to better uh, patient outcomes. You, you know, I've got, I've got a question. It may maybe sound a little bit off the wall, but we have these other technologies in the operating room like surgical navigation where, you know, you take a CT scan prior to surgery and input that information into a navigator so that during the surgery you're being guided. Is there any interface between something like that with the digital surgery, like for tumor surgery what or what have you, where you can make sure you're getting the margins? Anything like that in development that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, this incorporating, you know, preoperative imaging is, is something technologically it can be done, right? And you see that in orthopedic cases quite a lot because it's it's a lot easier to deal with the hard tissue rather than soft tissue. Soft tissue things move. But when you talk about tumors and then margins, the most common methodology employed really in terms of digital is using different imaging modalities, you know, uh, fluorescence imaging, ICG based and, and things like that, which are not pre-operative imaging, but they are really live imaging. But they, it's not technically, it is very feasible to overlay and, and use uh, pre-operative imaging. It's more the fidelity from the time you took the image to the time you're doing the surgery, how uh, you know how similar will everything be? That's that correlation is is, is something that uh, is not a hundred percent similar like an orthopedic case. You know, it doesn't change. So, what are the main focuses? We talked about you know patient outcomes, and we talked about clinician involvement. But you know, you speaking from the perspective of an innovation company, what are the focuses of the development of digital technology in your mind? What are what are you trying to do to improve all of surgery for the future? Yeah, so for us, um, just in that three things we're focusing on. One is reducing the variability in surgery, and we believe if we do that, we can reduce complications. That's the second one, and and really the third one is to level the field in terms of skill. You know, trying to take the best from everywhere and enable that knowledge to be leverage everywhere so it is really around the skill and and, and and level the field in terms of knowledge i think if we achieve those three then i think the true digital technology can very clearly you know lead the way in, in improving outcomes for patients and you mentioned something to me about measuring efficiencies and i can see where that you know could be very helpful but there's also all of this data, and I think the way you termed it was performance guided surgery and talking about creating these boundaries and everything else. But that's really taking, you know, information that is not necessarily on a spreadsheet. Like I think a lot of times when people think about data, they're thinking about information on a spreadsheet and, you know, it's, it's, it's a number and it's very finite and it's, it's right there. But when we start talking about surgery and the measurements and trying to do all of that, it's a whole different complexity of data sets. So how do we take all that data, especially where it doesn't just live in a simple kind of like spreadsheet format, pull that together and then really do any kind of analysis on it to give us these better insights? I mean, to me, a big portion of it seems like it's still somewhat subjective and for it to be good data to give us good insights. How do we move and make that more and more objective, you know, from one surgeon to another and from one patient to another, considering the variability in both of those factors? Yeah, just, you know, obviously it's going to be tons of data, right? I mean, when we talk about performance guided surgery, 
we kind of came up with a framework that we call the surgical assurance framework that focuses on pre intra and post op phases and and what does each phase what do we need to deliver in each phase and and the other piece is this data this is not a localized data kind of a mechanism all the data that we collect with this pre intra or, or post we are going to push this data to the cloud where this data will be processed in the cloud that's where the more data is going to come from different sources that's where the big data cloud is going to be leveraged and then over time as that builds now that knowledge can be harnessed back in another operating room so it's it's basically data moving from a operating room to going to the cloud and the cloud has this this vast amount of data that certain insights are gathered and then that gets pushed back in certain cyclical uh, kind of a format so it it is a lot of data and and that's really where all the computing power and the cloud really helps in order to make sense of all this data find patterns and and see what good looks like and so it it's, it'll be a big pretty big cloud kind of exercise and the sharing of all that information is so critical right like um to really get somewhere and get the kind of data that you need it couldn't just be siloed like hey we only use it at this facility with these you know 10 surgeons and that gives us enough to create the framework because of that variability in patient and surgical technique and knowledge and training and all of those things you almost have to aggregate data from all the users of this technology to be able to really draw those kinds of insights is that what you mean by putting it in the cloud and letting the cloud you know kind of process that data for usability yeah it's leveraging best practice and in a in somewhat of a blinded sense right it's it's not specific that there are no tags or labels of a surgeon or a patient or a institution for that matter we might know the bmi of the patient we might know certain anatomical characteristics of the patient and 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 that will help match like for like in, in terms of leveraging the best outcome but yes that's the only way i think we have to look at variations as as much as possible in order to learn from and then deliver some good insights so anthony you know i i i can see where you can collect a lot of data on the patient preoperatively but how do you go about tracing the outcome of the patient because isn't that what really matters is you know maybe you have the best technique for pulling out the gallbladder surgically but how do you tie that to the outcome of that patient afterwards yeah so that's that's where not all data so for example if a certain institute you can just envision where an institution has their own data right so they'll have a lot more clarity around the surgical outcomes and all the surg- surgery related data with the patient information and then if that institution or that surgeon follows that patient obviously they have that information relating to the patient so that does not have not everything has to go up to the cloud so certain parts of the information can live within the institution where they can track outcomes and and uh, take a longer term view but then c- certain other elements that are blinded can go up to the cloud where those outcomes obviously can't be followed up there's no follow up to it so i think there'll be multiple layers of data and how it gets used and how it gets leveraged to improve performance overall all right excellent well anthony thank you for painting a picture a little bit of the future i think there's probably quite a few people out there that when we talked about telesurgery earlier are a little nervous about the surgeon being in a different state and i think this the current condition of technology as you mentioned with needing true 5g to pull something like that off obviously this is going to happen over time but lots of benefits in terms of you know again the ergonomics and even just the general efficiencies you know, of the surgeons, I'm just thinking less moving around, 
not necessarily not being physical at all throughout the day, but less running around from one place to another, maybe even more accessibility between cases to be able to handle other follow up or, or answer questions that they have along the way. So I can see how this can kind of pull together. But how last question before I close, how far off do you think in your estimation in terms of amount of years before the technology, I should say the infrastructure of technology could really support a surgeon being in one state and performing a surgery on a patient in another state, in your estimation? My estimation, I think there are some s- similar cases that have already been performed on a test scale. So I, I would say in the next five years, I think it's pretty fair to assume the technology would be at a point where you could do a remote surgery. Wow. Five when when the billing is going to catch up with that? All right, Anthony. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Very nice job. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. Thanks all. All right. That was Anthony Fernando, CEO at Ascensus. And Paul, at the very end, he said, this is only, you know, five years away. And what a radical shift to the paradigm that would be. I think the technology is five years away, but I wonder if the staff are truly only five years away that support the surgeon because, you know, I can just see the listeners to this show trying to comprehend just such a major change to the way they run their day to day. If this was up and running in the next five years, there'd clearly have to be several trained specialists initially to just make this launch happen. Well, you know, culturally, I think it's going to be a real challenge to get everybody on board. Look how long it takes surgeons to go along with doing a timeout. I mean, that is, you know, it's been 20 years since that started, and you still have people that that push back on that. So, yeah, there's going to be physicians who are going to have problems with this change because somebody's going to be taking their business away from another part of the country. How are they going to deal with that? That's really going to be something to see. But I think the technology is amazing, and I can see a lot of, ways where this can be very beneficial, you know, maybe starting out in more rural areas where the need might be greater to have a skilled surgeon on board. And then even for things like the military and things like that, you can, I I can imagine there's going to be a lot of need for that in the future. So very Yeah, just think about our troops overseas and you know, if if they really needed a, a surgeon specialist and they couldn't get home to get the type of procedure that they really need urgently, that's an implication for it. And I'll just say one thing on physician adoption, Paul, there's just nothing like a little competition to get that one going. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that regional piece could be one of the drivers for a technology like this to really take off as much as it might be a deterrent. Could Time be. will tell, right? Yeah, Time yeah. will tell. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support First Case by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or just search for First Case on your favorite podcast application. We've also got bonus content for you, and that's available for certain episodes. You just got to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. While you're there, we'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Paul and Melanie and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case. 